All right, so this is Galatians chapter 5, and um, just as we get ready for Galatians chapter 5, we'll start here, and I'll tell you, there's so much richness in, in Galatians, and, you know, just want to encourage you to go deep in this, and so we'll start here uh, with verse 1. Paul's talking about enslavement to the law. Again, he's trying to pound on the Galatians not to come under the law, not to be bound and shackled by the bondage of legalism. Verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So when Paul makes a statement, and I've heard, I've heard this preached a lot of different times, and normally it's out of context. But when Paul says the law, or when Paul says the yoke of slavery, he's talking about the law. And so, if you, you know, you probably have seen, you, I don't know, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. We're not, it's not really part of our culture. But in the first century, a yoke was a wooden bar which fastened two animals together like oxen. And that yoke allowed the two animals, the two oxen, to work together and labor together so that they could be, make the labor more productive. And so, anyway, the yoke of slavery is is basically the, the law for centuries was yoked upon the Jewish people. And that yoke of slavery just scarred them emotionally and mentally with guilt and shame and condemnation and death. In fact, Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, is this, 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 these tablets of stone are the ministry of condemnation and death. All they do is they point out to you what you cannot do in and of your own power. They point out to you the external commandments, the thou must and thou shalt, but you can't do it because you don't have the nature of God inside of you. And so this, for, for centuries, the, the Israelites were yoked with the law, and it was a heavy burden that weighed down upon their shoulders. They could never do enough. They could never obey enough. They could never be perfect, no matter all the sacrifices they made, no matter how well they kept the feast and the Sabbath. They could never, ever, ever fully comply with what God wanted. It was a yoke, a burden on them. In fact, in the Jerusalem Council, the apostles said, why do we want to put a yoke on the Gentiles that neither our fathers or us have ever been able to keep? So the, the, the law is a yoke of slavery that keeps you in bondage. And, and so the gospel of Jesus Christ comes... And Jesus wants to set us free from this yoke. Jesus wants to set us free from every form of legalism. And so even in the New Testament, even, as, even in today in the church, we don't really, I mean, you know, there, there is a movement in some messianic churches to try to bring the uh, Christians back under the law. But, you know, for us, a lot of our legalism is in the form of, I don't, I don't read the Bible enough. Now, we should be reading the Bible, obviously, but I... You know, we don't read the Bible to be accepted by God. We don't fast to be accepted by God. We don't witness so God will like us. We don't pray so that we can gain God's favor. You know, we talked about that in a few sessions ago. We obey from justification, not for justification. We obey from acceptance, not for acceptance. We obey from righteousness, not for righteousness. Major shift in, in thinking here. And Paul is saying that, that this, this, the law, when you are trying to be right with God or you're trying to be holy by external commandments and compliance with external commandments, it is a yoke of slavery that you carry. Now, Jesus talked about this in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, when the Lord said that, he was not trying to encourage people who were worn out from working 40 or 60 or 70 hours a week, who were worn out by five kids in the house, quarantined, like a lot of us have been, that we're worn out, we're tired. No, that's not what he's talking about. Now, we can apply it for sure. Jesus was addressing the Jewish people who of that day were under a heavy yoke of the law, and that legalism, 
that burden that weighed on them, that external commandments that was like this heavy stone they carried around for centuries. Jesus is saying, that yoke of slavery you have carried forever. I mean, not ever, but you've carried since your inception. I am now offering you a different, a different lifestyle. Take the yoke, take that yoke of slavery off called the law, the tablets of st on stone, and now come and receive my yoke. In other words, Jesus is here and we're here and walk with me. See, he invites us to exchange and to die to trying to always through law keeping and through stringent, meticulous obedience to try to be right with God. And he says, now you are justified. Now you are right with God. Now you have been declared righteous. Now take my yoke on you. It's light. Take my yoke on you and let it be on your shoulders. It's light. It's easy. And walk with me. That's the heart of Jesus. Isn't it beautiful? And he says, learn of me, for I am meek and I'm humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, the Lord wants us to exchange the heavy yoke of legalism, of trying to please God for the relationship with a person. God has not called you into a relationship with a tablets of stone. God has not called you into a relationship of external commandments of thou shalt and thou shalt not. He's called you into a relationship with a person, a living, breathing person who has been raised from the dead, whose spirit now lives in you. Come to me. How beautiful is that? Come to me. Learn of me. Know me. Know me deeply. Know me deeply, experientially. Verse 2. Galatians 5, verse 2, Paul says, Behold, I say to you, if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And again, verse 3, I testify to every man who receives circumcision that he is un under obligation to keep the whole law. See, when, when we, you know, today in our day, males are circumcised, but it's more for health reasons than it is uh, for as a mark of the covenant. But in the old, you know, in the time of Jesus, the, and all the way back to Abraham, circumcision was a mark of the old covenant. Circumcision was a mark that you are in covenant with God. And Paul is saying, if you are taking a covenant mark to go back, to go into the old covenant, he's saying, let me give you a warning. Jesus Christ will be of no benefit to you. If, see, here's what he's saying is, is when the ancient Israelites, when they wanted to enter into the old covenant, they took the mark of circumcision as a covenant mark that said, I am in covenant with God. If you take that mark and you go under the old covenant, then realize this, you are under obligation to keep every single commandment in the law, all 613 commandments of the law. You are under obligation to keep every single one of those commandments. And so Paul's warning the Galatians, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't go back under the law. Verse 4, another warning. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Wow, what a warning. If you are trying to be justified by law-keeping, if you are trying to be justified by commandment keeping, this is what Paul says, you have fallen from grace. Isn't that crazy? You know, I, I thought today, you know, I, today is like, you know, you've fallen from grace if you commit sin. You've fallen from grace if you did this, this, or that, you know, these sinful acts. And now that certainly is true, but that's the things we highlight today. But Paul's saying, You've fallen from grace if you're trying with your willpower, with gritted teeth, to be right with God by law-keeping and commandment-keeping. You've fallen from grace. See, if you try to obey God's commands in order to become righteous and accepted by Him, you will get a wage that corresponds with your work. 
Like ancient Israel, if you are obedient, then you will be blessed. If you are disobedient in the slightest way, even in your heart, then you will be cursed. See, this whole attitude of bless me for obedience, curse me for disobedience, you, whatever, however good you do or however bad you do, you will get a wage corresponding to your work, just like we do when, when, when we work on our jobs. If we do our job, then we get a wage. If we don't do our job, we don't get a wage. That's not grace. That's not the free gift of grace. And so Paul is saying, if you're under the law, if you're under this, bless me, I'm blessed because I'm, ob I'm obedient, I'm cursed if I'm disobedient, that whole system of what being under the law was like, if you're still under that, and that still motivates you and drives you. Paul's saying, he's saying, you get the wage you deserve. But grace is not like that. Grace is the unmerited gift of God. Grace is not earned or deserved. Grace is a gift that God gives. Grace is when God says that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, apart from any works of the law, you are justified. You are declared righteous. No matter what you have done, no matter your past, no matter how dark it is, no matter your guilt and shame, when you don't try to work to try to please God, but you receive by faith the gift of righteousness and what Jesus did for you on the cross, then Paul is saying the gift of righteousness is imputed to you. And his grace is given to you, not by what you do, but through your faith and your belief. That is so beautiful. That's the gospel. The gospel that is by grace alone, by faith alone, apart from any works of the law. It's awesome. See, grace not only gives us better than we deserve, grace gives us what we could never produce. We could never be right with God, ever, but grace makes us right with Him. We could never have God's Spirit in us because we're dead in our sins, but grace raises our spirit up from death into life. We could never be holy or righteous, but grace resurrects us, and the Spirit of God comes to dwell in us and makes our spirit righteous and holy and complete, one with Him. See, grace is the unearned, undeserved, unmerited power of God that enables us to be who God's called us to be and to do what He's called us to do, and we cannot work for it, we cannot earn it, we can only receive it. The law condemns the best of us. Grace saves the worst of us. Incredible. We need to get back to this gospel. We need to get back to the incredible gospel of Jesus Christ as our world is on fire, as just riots and looting and lawlessness and anarchy is taking over cities in America. And there's just, you can't even watch the news anymore because it's just bad. You can't even watch the news because it just makes you depressed. We need to get back to the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are saved by grace uh, through faith apart from anything we do but only what Christ has done. And that's what Paul teaches here in Galatians. Verse 5, and he warns, in fact, he warns us. He says, if you are trying to be justified or sanctified by law-keeping, by obedience, instead of by faith and receiving grace, and from that faith and receiving grace, obeying and following the leading of the Holy Spirit in union with Him. If you're seeking to be justified and sanctified by law-keeping, you are severed from Christ. That's, that is, wow, a severe warning to, to uh, any of us that if legalism penetrates into our mindset that we can cut us off from Christ and you are fallen from grace. Those are some pretty serious warnings if we're trying to, through our legalistic, self-determined, grit your teeth, I'm going to do it, self-righteous, proud attitude of keeping God's commandments. If we have that, God's saying, you've fallen from grace. You're seeking to be justified by external commandments. That is not going to do it. It is by faith through grace. It is by grace through faith. It is, it is not by the works of the law. It is by hearing with faith. Verse 5, Paul says, For we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. 
This is really what he's aiming at. Paul's, Paul's saying is like, you were not called into a relationship with, a, with tablets of stone. You were called into a relationship with a glorious, beautiful person, the eternal, uncreated Son of God, who was crucified, buried, and resurrected, and has now poured out his spirit, and he's coming again. You were called into a relationship with Jesus. And he's, I, I believe when he makes this statement, he he's, has in mind the, the thought of Titus 2.13, we're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe he was also thinking of Romans 8.23-25 as, as we have the first fruits of the Spirit, but we're groaning within ourselves for the fullness. We're groaning within ourselves for our, our adoption to be finalized when we receive a new body and Jesus Christ comes back. So the hope of righteousness... The hope of righteousness that Paul is talking about here is the glorious appearing and revelation of Jesus Christ when he returns. It's the fullness of the Spirit permeating and filling our spirit, hearts, souls, and bodies. It's sun placement into Christ's inheritance, and it's the transformation of our bodies laden with sin and death, transformed into the glorious nature of Jesus Christ. Paul's telling the Galatians that that Christ is the Messiah. He is the goal of the law. The law is not the goal. Christ is the goal. Christ is the end of the law. Christ is the, what the law was pointing to. You've been called into an incredibly beautiful relationship with the person, with the Messiah. And we wait for this, the fullness of this promise by, by the Spirit and by faith. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. And Paul's building up to really the, the epic point of the entire thing. We're getting, we're getting into it is, is Paul saying, <clears throat> you can be a circumcised Jew or you can be an uncircumcised Gentile. You can be in the old covenant with God or you cannot be, a, you can be a pagan demon worshiper. He's like, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, that means nothing. That means nothing. Your law keeping, it means nothing. Here's what really is what the goal is all about, is faith working through love. Faith working through love. See, um, where Paul is leading us to is when, he's gonna, when he says in a few verses down, the entire law is fulfilled in one word, love. See, if we, love, if we keep the first commandment and the second commandment, if we keep the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength and love in the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, Paul is telling us if you love, you will keep the entire law. Every one of the commandments will be fulfilled in you by the simple commandment to love. Isn't that beautiful? That is incredible. The goal of this whole thing is love. <clears throat> is love. It's for the Holy Spirit's love poured out upon our hearts, tenderizing our hearts, melting our hearts, filling our hearts, permeating our hearts, and our hearts being baptized afresh in love. And that love filling us then permeates into our mind, our will, our emotions, works itself out into our body. Faith then rises up. And as love is motivating us and faith is moving us, we then, as the body of Christ, become the hands and the feet of Jesus. Our works are done by faith, motivated by love. And then we, <clears throat> loving our neighbor as ourself, we then do the very thing our neighbor wants and needs. That's faith working through love. And if we do that, we fulfill the entire law. Now, and Paul's going to unpack that here in a minute. But in verse 7, he said the, the Judaizers are disturbing the Galatians, and he says, you, verse 7, you were running well. I'm, I want to tell you, you were doing so good. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You were doing so good. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? 
This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. And so what had happened is the, the Galatians, we've seen it over and over, they responded with hearing with faith. The Spirit was poured out. Miracles were flowing. And it was an incredible beginning. And Paul's like, you were doing awesome. You were doing incredible. You had an incredible beginning. But something happened in this persuasion that you have come from, even though they come in the name of God, even though they come and they say, you've got to keep these commandments to please God, even though they come in the name of God, Paul's saying this persuasion that's like leaven in bread is poison. It's not from God. These Judaizers who want to disturb you is not from God. They are, they are masquerading as an angel of light. They are masquerading as servants of righteousness, but they are in fact empowered by demons. Beware of them because a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. In fact, Jesus even warned about that in, in his teaching about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This leaven of legalistic teaching that gets into the body of Christ that says you've got to do A, B, C, D, and E for God to accept you and God to like you and God to love you. Paul's saying that little leaven, that little bit of mindset, that little bit of thinking will cause the entire teaching to be poisoned with legalism, with dead religion, and it will profit you nothing. <clears throat> he warns them. Now we get to verse 10. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. So Paul is realizing there is a group of Judaizers, and there is one main Judaizer who's the ringleader, and he's the one stirring up all the contention. He's the one stirring up all the confusion. He's the one who's disturbing the, the Galatians and saying, you got to be circumcised and you got to keep the whole law. And Paul is saying, whoever this one ringleader is, he is going to be judged by God because he's preaching a false gospel. He's preaching a gospel that's cursed. In fact, he says, let him be accursed. Paul is saying, whoever this one is, he will bear his judgment. God will, God will judge this false teacher and the false teachers that have come in with them. Verse 11, but I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. And so in verse 11, Paul's saying is it, it, the Judaizers were making a claim. Again, they were trying to, they were trying to discredit the messenger so they could, they could discredit the message because they didn't like the freedom Paul was preaching. And they were claiming that Paul... They were claiming something like this. To, to the Gentiles, Paul is preaching uncircumcision. But hey, guys, have you ever heard him preach to the Jews? When he preaches to the Jews, he preaches, uh, you need to be circumcised. Because he's a man pleaser. He's empowered by the fear of man. He's enshackled by the fear of man. And Paul's like, okay, if this is really true, if I'm preaching circumcision, He's like, the, 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 I'm, have you not heard my message of the cross? The cross is, itself is a stumbling block to the Jews. They cannot get over that God's grace is unmerited and undeserved. They cannot get over the fact that it is by grace alone that we're saved. And it's a stumbling block to them. If I was, if I was still preaching circumcision, the cross, I couldn't, have, I couldn't preach the cross like I preach and circumcision. And then verse 12 I really like verse 12 a lot because I'm very sarcastic in my uh, humor. And Paul here is, is showing us his sarcasm. He says, I wish that those who were troubling you would even mutilate themselves. In other words, the, the Judaizers are saying, hey, Galatians, you got to get circumcised. you got to go take a, a knife and cut the foreskin off. And, you know, that would have to be painful, I would imagine. And Paul's saying, yeah, if they're telling you to do that, why don't you tell them to mutilate themselves? I mean... You know, why don't you tell them to go cut themselves and endure the pain if they were trying to do that to you? He's like, this is ridiculous. It's a tone of sarcasm. But here we get to the meat of where Paul's leading us to. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 and through 15. For you were called to freedom, brethren. You were called to freedom, 
Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. See, Paul is saying is that, he's saying to us is that you are called to freedom. You are not to be shackled with the bondage of the law, that heavy yoke that rested upon ancient Israel and just weighed them down and burdened them down. You are not to be shackled with that. You were called to freedom, but, and this is what we've got to hear so clearly, don't allow your freedom to become an opportunity for the flesh. And I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus Christ, there's a lot of preachers proclaiming liberty and freedom who are empowering the flesh, who are giving them liberty. And what, what Jude said, they, they proclaim the grace of God, but they take the grace of God and they turn it into a license for sin, licentiousness. And Paul is saying, hey, listen, okay, the, the law is a burden upon you. You need to be set free from that burden of legalism. But don't go so far to now allow your flesh to be gratified. It doesn't mean now you can go party like the world and you can go get drunk like the world and you can go engage in immorality like the world and you can go gossip or watch whatever and hear whatever you want to hear like the world. No, no, no. That's not what Paul is saying. And some of the hyper-grace teachers today who take the doctrine of God's beautiful grace that sets us free from legalism and sets us free from the law and shatters guilt, shame, and condemnation, some of them are going so far and they're pushing and they're allowing and they're giving a license for people to sin without consequence. And Paul's saying, no, this is not an opportunity for your flesh. It's not an opportunity for your flesh. Paul is going to list a few verses down, and we'll look at that later, is Paul's going to look at that, and he's going to name the deeds of the flesh. And he's, saying, he's going to tell us, okay, what exactly do you mean by an opportunity for the flesh? He's going to tell us, and he lists things like immorality and idolatry and contention and strife and witchcraft and jealousy and outburst of anger and sensuality. And He's saying, your freedom does not mean you go serve the flesh. Your freedom now means you're empowered to love one another. See, we are set free from the law so we can love and serve one another. That's what it's all about. That's what we're called to do is to buy through love to serve one another. And so, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a safeguard against lawlessness and legalism. We need to be aware both of legalism and lawlessness. Is there's no room in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ for legalism, and there's no place for lawlessness that says we can just go do whatever we want to do without consequence. Without, and so Paul's getting at now in verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul basically says the same thing in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. He says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Wow, how beautiful. That's so incredible. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it's summed up in the saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor and therefore is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said something very similar in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. He said that, that he said, if you love God wholeheartedly and you love your neighbor as yourself, he says the entire law and the prophets hinge on these two commandments. Love for God love for people. See, love is the fulfillment of the entire law. See, God could not do anything better under, until the Messiah came, until the Spirit was poured out. He could not do anything better than the law, the 613 commandments, but the law could never impart righteousness. External commandments can never impart righteousness. External commandments can never impart life. Only the Spirit of God can impart life. Now, in our notes here, 
I go through and list the different Ten Commandments and, and talk about how love fulfills the law. Let's look, at, let's look at these real quick. The first and second commandment against idolatry. And so love, Jesus and Paul said, love fulfills the entire law. If we love God wholeheartedly, we are not going to put any other God, idol, or any other person or thing above him. The third commandment. Blasphemy. If we love God wholeheartedly, we are not going to speak anything against God. We don't want to say anything against Him. We don't want to accuse Him wrongly. We don't want to curse Him in a moment of anger. We don't want to do anything uh, that would speak against God to blaspheme His name because love burns in us for Him. The, the uh, fourth commandment, or the fifth commandment, dishonor. Talking about dishonor. See, when we love our neighbor as ourself, we will show honor to everyone, starting with our parents, and we will show it just as if we would want to be honored. See, when we truly love our neighbor as ourself, we are going to show honor down the authority structure that has, God has placed into our life, up the authority structure God has placed into our life, is we are going to honor those over us in authority and we're going to love those under us in authority. We're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. The sixth commandment, murder, is if we love our neighbor as ourselves, we're not going to kill anyone, but we're not also even like Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. We're not going to speak against someone. So we can murder someone, not with our hands, not with weapons, but we can murder them with our tongue, with our mouth, and the words we speak, and the words we say, and our accusations, our judgments, our criticisms. You know, our words can be used to murder people. And when we love our neighbor as ourselves, we will never speak against someone or gossip against someone in an unrighteous way. The seventh commandment, sexual immorality. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, we are not going to violate God's requirement of sex within the context of marriage between one man and one woman. Every other form of sexual sin outside this context and covenant of marriage is selfish and self-serving. See, every sexual sin outside of the covenant of marriage is to serve yourself. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, if you love someone else, you are not going to violate that commandment because you would bring them into sin and yourself into sin. The eighth commandment, stealing. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, we are not going to take anything from anyone. We're not going to take their time, their possessions, their money. The ninth commandment, uh, bearing false witness. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, we are not going to accuse someone falsely. We are not going to agree with false accusation. We are not going to stand back and say, when judgments and criticisms come that are unrighteous and not from the Lord, we are not going to just accept those and say, okay, that's fine. The Tenth Commandment, coveting. When we love our neighbor as ourself, we will look at, and this is, this is way easier to say than to do, but I'm just saying what if we truly walk in Second Commandment love for other people, when we see our friend or we see someone on social media, we see our neighbor being blessed, and you know it might even look like they're more blessed than we are. Their family might be more blessed than we are. Their house might be better than ours. Our, you know, their job might be better. They might have more influence and all that. When we love our neighbor as ourself, we are not going to be jealous or covet or envy the blessing God has given to them. We are going to rejoice in the fact because we love them like we love ourselves. We're going to rejoice in the fact that they are blessed and they are happy and God has shown favor on them. Again, harder than it is, to, easier to say than do. But that, that's what Paul is talking about. The law is fulfilled by love. And Jesus said in, in John chapter 13, he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. The entire law is fulfilled by love. Love for God, love for people. See, when, when God's love poured out on our heart by the Holy Spirit begins to fill us, begins to move us, and faith begins to spring up, and our action begins to work through love, faith working through love, um, when that begins to happen, 
then we are fulfilling the commandment that will fill, fulfill every other commandment. Love fulfills the entire law. But here is a warning for us. Some have taken this, this statement by Jesus that if you love one another even as I have loved you, some have taken that, this new commandment of Jesus to now mean that the the law's definition of sin is now erased so that whatever is love is love. You know, what's love for me is not love for you, and what's love for you is not what's love for me. So we're going to have up, you know, trying to obey the Lord's commandment to show love. We're now going to come up with a new definition of what's, what's righteous and unrighteous, and the Lord, Lord's like, no, that's not what that means. The law's definition of sin is never going to go away. Paul said, is the law unholy? By no means it's unholy. I wouldn't know that coveting was wrong if the laws did not say you shall not covet. So what, 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 what we got to be aware of is that we don't go on the slippery slope to say love now defines right and wrong. That's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what Paul's saying. Love does not define what's right or wrong. Love is the power that enables us to do right and to refrain from wrong. The law's definition of sin never goes away. It's never abolished. It defines what sin is. And for example, it's easy. And I've, I've, seen, I've seen just watching people who take this definition of Jesus' love that, that, you know, we love one another even as you have loved us. And so they say, well, two men, they love each other. What's wrong with two men who love each other? Like Jesus said, you know, love one another. That's the commandment. That's the new commandment. It replaces what the law has said. And so what's wrong with if two men love each other to get married? Or another, another, another slippery slope here is, is you've got a man and he says, I love five women equally. What's wrong? You know, Jesus says for me to love one another even as I have loved. And so what's wrong with me taking these five women as my wives? Because the Lord's in this commandment, when he says, love one another, even as I have loved you, he's not saying this replaces, replaces the law in terms of defining sin. It's the power of God inside of us, enabling us to fulfill the requirement of the law. This commandment does not, the Lord's commandment does not erase the law's definition of what sin is. Read the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but I've come to fulfill them. And my fulfillment is within the heart and the soul of my people who have my spirit. And the spirit of God is then living in them besides and not them. And him living in them and not them empowers them to obey the requirements of the law. Paul mentions this in Romans chapter 8 verse 4. He says that those who are led by the Spirit are going to, uh, those who are led by the Spirit, the, the requirement of the law is fulfilled in those who are led by the Spirit. When we are led by the Spirit, when the Spirit of God is our Lord, when the Spirit of God is leading us, when the Spirit of God is filling us and moving through us, and the Spirit of God is living rather than us, what Paul is saying is that the requirements, the, the standard, the high and lofty standard of the law is no longer a burden on your shoulders because now the Spirit of God in you is enabling you to obey the requirement of the law. Loving does not erase the requirement of the law. Loving does not change the definition of sin. Loving by the Spirit of God is how we keep the requirements of the law that, that, that Moses laid out. That's how we keep the requirements of the law. When we love our neighbor as ourselves, we love as Jesus has loved us. We love God and we love people. We love ourselves. All of that, when, when that takes place within us, then we will fulfill the entire law. That is so beautiful. I, I just love, I love this. This is what it is all about. It's not circumcision or uncircumcision. It's not your external co compliance with the commandments of thou shalls and thou shall not. It is a life of a relationship with God internally, and him living internally pours out his love upon your heart 
moves you uh, in such a way that you love God and you love your neighbor as you love yourself, that love then springs forth faith, the faith of the Son of God, love or faith working through love outside into your body into acts to serve one another, not to provide your flesh with an opportunity to sin. That's not freedom. That's not liberty. Not to do that, but through love to serve one another. And when you, through love, serve one another, you are fulfilling the law of Christ. That's what it's all about. The law is fulfilled in one word, love. It's not changed by love. It's fulfilled by love. And he goes on here in verse 15. He says, But if you you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Now, it's interesting that Paul is talking about biting and devouring, which which is something our mouth does. And I think figuratively speaking, Paul is wanting to hit on our mouth, which is the source of so much strife and contention. Biting is the little nibbles we take, the little shots we take of accusation, the little shots we take of judgment, the little shots we take of criticism or, uh, you know, just whatever, slander. It would be slowly and surely we're biting people through our words. Devouring means we just give it all at once and we are seeking to destroy them. Paul's saying, beware, if you're going to slowly nibble someone to death by your, by your constant words to them, or if you're going to just drop the bomb all at once, beware, I'm telling you, if you, are, if you bite and devour one another, you're going to be consumed one another by one another. And I, I think it's interesting, right after this, that Paul's talking about love, he's saying, guard your mouth, because one of the ways we demonstrate second commandment love is how we speak about another person is whether we're going to accuse them, whether we're going to gossip, whether we're going to criticize, whether we're going to be envious or jealous and use our words to voice out slander against them and speak against them. And Paul would say, be be careful, guys. If you do that, you're going to be devoured yourself. Second commandment love would not speak against another person in the body of Jesus Christ or outside of the body of Jesus Christ. Be careful how you speak against one another. So that's uh, Galatians chapter 5 so far. Um, I'm going to pick up with the rest of Galatians 5 in the next session when we talk about living by the flesh and living by the Spirit because it's way too much to get in into this one session. So we'll pick up with that in, in the next session, and we'll end Galatians 5 here.